An activist since the end of the 90s, Claudio has been a part of many campaigns and projects in Italy. In 2002, he co-founded a campaign that forced to close Morini Beagle Breeders, suppliers of Italian labs, since 30 years. In 2010, he co-founded a campaign against Greenhill Beagle Breeders with similar success. In 2011, he co-founded the abolitionist organization Nemesis Animale. In the next presentation, Claudio will give us an insight into the campaign against the Greenhill Beagle Breeders in Italy and elaborate on the pros and cons of the strategy used. Please welcome Claudio Pomo. Hello. Um, I would like to start like um, showing you like this picture. I think many of you have already seen it, and it's. Uh, I think it is a part of the history of the movement, not only in, in Italy, but everywhere in the worldwide movement. This, is, this picture um, is a summary of all we want, like the liberation of animals and people really handing out animals from a place of abuse. And I would like to talk now about the campaign we did and how we managed to get to this day of action where 70 beagles were uh, uh, liberated from this farm uh, in a daylight raid, and so I would like to to start like with um, a brief history of what we did before in Italy and what happened also outside of Italy as um, campaigns against vivisection, and because I think it's really really important to know our history, our past as a movement, because we cannot start uh, new campaigns without knowing how the previous campaigns were working, how they were organized, what was going well and what went wrong. So, as was said before, I took part in quite a few campaigns before the Green Hill one. And just to, just to explain to people that do not know, Green Hill is a, was a very big uh, breeder of dogs for vivisection labs. They were sending 2,250 uh, beagles every month to all European labs and it was one of the biggest in Europe. So just to give you a, like a summary of what we did in Italy in the past years when we started, you know, like the first attempt to start grassroots campaigns were in 2001 with the Shack campaign in Italy. Some of you are aware probably what the Shack campaign was. It was a campaign that started in England in 99 to uh, close down Hunting the Life Sciences, which is Europe's biggest uh, vivisection lab. And we started just as a... Italian chapter of this campaign, which was really mobilizing hundreds and hundreds of people all around the world, was a great um, inspiration for all of us. And then in 2002, we started the, our own campaign against another big old breeder, and that was also breeding rodents of different species uh, for vivisection labs. And there is a small summary. These campaigns were uh, quite similar. There was a kind of typical grassroots um, campaign method that was used at the time. Maybe some of you are not um, have, do not know well what was happening before, like with previous uh, really inspiring campaigns in the UK where um, other breeders of animals for the vivisection labs were closed, like Consort Beagles and Hillgrove Cat Farm and various other farms were closed down by English activists with really radical grassroots campaigns that were uh, going toward uh, the closure of the place like uh, with really a uh, good uh, attitude. But um, I, will, I would like to explain why this campaign we did now in Italy was quite different from then. And at, the, at first, like with the Morini Farm campaign, it was really similar to the UK campaigns. And it was based on, you know, continuous demos at the farm, continuous demos at, in front of the house of the workers, continuous demos in front of every company that was connected to this uh, farm until they had no contacts anymore. Their life was continuously, uh, was um, really ruined and this family that was owning the farm. They really had some serious problems going on with their work. But this kind of attitude, this kind of campaign uh, brought a lot of repression for us. Uh, it was the similar case also in the UK. I also put another campaign we did in Italy against fur that went on for a few years. And 
you can see the difference when you start a campaign against vivisection. You're, it's just you and your target, and you have to fight them and close them down, and you go on towards them, while in an anti fur campaign, where you are in front of stores, maybe if you do a, a fur stores campaign or a, a department stores to stop them uh, selling fur, um, you, it's you, them, but it is also the public. You can ask the public to boycott them, and you can involve the public and have them on your side. And as I put also on the title of this uh, workshop and presentation, I would like to show, like, we tried to uh, evolve a different kind of campaign for against, against vivisection, trying to include also the public with us and include a different approach. So now I tried to summarize the typical uh, grass differences of grassroots vivisection campaigns and let's call them NGOs campaigns and it's not always like this but it's more or less like this like grassroots campaigns are really based on militancy you can see all these demos very angry shouting and running inside offices and there is a lot of direct action supporting the, the campaigns usually and there is this us versus them attitude and um, which is also sometimes, as I said before, it's, there is no other way. It's, it's you and the family owning the farm, and so it's you and this family is typically living in a small village. And sometimes, not always, there have been a lot of controversial actions happening because, you know, there are some, maybe uh, usually anonymous people were doing some actions just to help the campaign, but which were very, very controversial and created a lot of bad media. And one of the attitudes that was going on usually was uh, in the UK, but also it was in Italy a few years ago, the same more or less was bad media is still good media. We don't care about what the media says. And this is an attitude that is like our, um, our goal is not to have the public uh, on with us, but it's just us versus this company, us versus this family, and we have to scare them, we have to force them, whatever, to seize what they're doing and stop their company. And with this attitude, especially in the UK, with a lot of controversial actions happening and a lot of repression coming on later, there was a loss, a big loss of public support. And there was a lot of repression, a lot of people were sent to jail. And this, this created a lot of problems. And what we evaluated later and we tried to evolve in Italy for our campaign was like, looking at what was happening in the UK, what was happening in the US, what we were doing, and trying to think in a different way and trying to find other tools in the toolbox. So the typical NGO vivisection campaign is uh, usually, you can think of big organizations, no militancy at all, really fluffy campaigning, and really sometimes we say them they are quite useless campaigns, or kind of really just to get some media, but really not reaching any goal, usually. And they do a lot of political lobbying and create a lot of public support, actually. And this is their main aim. And they do public-friendly activism. Uh, they do no controversial actions. And they've got a media-friendly campaigning because they say good media is important. We do not have to alienate the public from us. And of course, NGOs usually do not get any repression. Then anything can happen in the world. And this is kind of what we try to evaluate, like keeping the typical, changing a lot of things from the grassroots vivisection campaign and just keeping one, uh, one thing, which was the militancy, but not too much, which means having, being militant, still continuing using a lot of civil disobedience, using a lot of big actions, but not in a way that could outrage the public, but that could inspire the public and keep them on our side. And then we decided to start doing not us versus them, but include the public with us and being us and the public against this company, against the government um, helping this company. And then to reach that, we had to use, of course, public-friendly activism, media-friendly campaigning, and of course, we got repression, but less repression that we got with pre previous campaigns where the police were beating us at demos, they were um, arresting or raiding our homes and creating a lot of troubles. And in this case, having whole Italy and uh, the whole public on our side with such a popular support, it was 
more difficult to create harsh repression against us. So how did we go, the, how did we get there? The story is quite long, I'll try to summarize it very quickly, so I will go on quite quickly. And the campaign is started in April 2010 because we knew, uh, we have been lucky actually with this campaign, I, will, I want to focus on this because we do not have a magic uh, you know, uh, thing, like we can solve any problems, any solution, we just uh, developed a strategy to close down this place uh, starting from some luck we had, which was having a lot of good information about this farm. One of these very important informations was a tip that uh, some they were going to build five new sheds, they were going to expand the company and start having not, no more 2,500 dogs, but 5,000 dogs. So we started this campaign as a kind of emergency campaign, we have to stop this and we have to stop the expansion project uh, immediately, as soon as we can. And then we said, we will see what we can do. We, we organized this big demo with uh, 3,000 people came. There was such a, uh, an attention for it that we managed to, close, to stop the expansion project just the week before the demo. The city council signed immediately a no to this project. So we had won our, green, our campaign immediately, which was called Stop Green Hill and Not Close Down, because we, from the beginning we were like very humble and we said, we're never going to say we will go on forever uh, to close down this place. We said, okay, let's start really humble. And then we had to evaluate then a strategy to go on. We decided, okay, we have to close down this place now. We have loads of people supporting us. We have uh, a lot of attention, the media also was interested in the story. So we started to evaluate, uh, to create a strategy. And when you do a campaign, you, have, you need a strategy. There has been a lot of interesting talks these days here at the conference about strategy and strategic thinking. I think um, it's very important to have a long-term um, strategy, long-term goals, and then um, short-term goals, which are also very, very important. So. In a campaign like this, our longer term goals would be like having, um, of course, closing down the farm, but was not the only goal we had actually. Since the beginning, we said we have to use this opportunity we have, like with this company, which is so evil for everybody. You know that I think 95% uh, of, of the people, like more than 90% of people love dogs. So we have this opportunity of such an evil place in Italy, so big, so huge, that we can use it to open the eyes of the public and get um, a message there and get the people uh, understand what's going on inside labs. And so we wanted to use this campaign, not just us versus them, not just to close down the place, which was of course a very important aim, but um, this campaign was used like to open a door and the door was the door of all vivisection labs in Italy and create a struggle against vivisection. And then you have the short-term goals which are changing during a campaign, of course, because uh, things are changing fast sometimes. And so our strategy was very different than the one that you could see in other campaigns, like it's us and the company, so we have to find out the company and uh, um, doing demos there every week or twice a week. We instead decided, okay, we, we've been lucky, as I said before, because we knew a lot of um, stuff that was going on inside this farm that was not really legal, or at least could bring attention to the lab by authorities or should at least change something there. So we decided, okay, our target is not the farm itself, because it, this farm is owned by the biggest multinational in the world that is breeding dogs. It's called Marshall Farms. It's an American company. They have millions and millions of euros. They will never stop because of our demos in front of their offices, in front of their farm. They will never stop because they lose money because of our campaign, because just the Italian part of their company had four, uh, million, four million euros aside just for some economic problems. So, you know, it's, it was not this the idea, uh, the way that we could close them down. So we decided, okay, our target is not them. Our target is above them. 
It's the authorities that give them the licenses, the authorities that are not controlling them, it's the authorities that have to change something in there. And by attacking the authorities, we could let the people in Italy understand that there is someone that is deciding that vivisection can go on, where it goes on. They know everything and they do not do anything about the animals. And we also could have the people even more angry because, you know, like it's not just this evil company, but it's the whole government that is using people's money, tax money to fund vivisection. And they're using everything and they do not do anything to solve, uh, to save these animals or close down a place that uh, an American company is building in Italy with a lot of controversial practices going on. So just to explain uh, in short our campaign, how it was going on. So then we did a big demo in May, like you already read it with 1000 protesters. But the big thing is we always try to get some side effects with this campaign. And side effects means uh, sometimes you, are, you have a campaign against the company, but you can get other results with other companies. And the biggest one is the local airports made a statement and they're no longer shipping any animals of any species in their airport, which is very important. So then there was a European directive. I, I hope some of you were at this previous workshop about the Stop VV Section Citizens Initiative. And the European directive was voted in 2010. It created such an outrage all over Europe and especially in Italy because it's a very, very bad directive and we hope we can change it. After that, we could have 10,000 people marching in Rome because we were going to the capital of Italy asking the ministers to resolve what was going wrong in Green Hill. And um, then we were going to the regional council. We did this very uh, funny action disrupting the council, which was the first time ever that the council was disrupted by activists. And it was very funny because there was already a lot of press there because there was a Berlusconi scandal just the same day happening. We didn't know it. We found a lot of TVs there. And then the campaign went on like, you know, targeting, um, still targeting the region in that, day, in that period because the reason was there is a regional law that says all kennels, all dog shelters, all dog breeders, they have to keep the animals in certain cages they have to be allowed to stay outside a bit, certain measures, and they cannot have more than 300 uh, dogs. And there is just one farm, you can imagine, called Green Hill that had 2,500 dogs and not the same measures. Of course, we didn't want these measures to be applied, but we, know, we knew that if they applied this law to them, they would close down. So they, they were a big target for us. For months and months, we did also some kind of creative communication actions in the center, trying to get media attention. And then we arrived at a moment where the, the um, campaign really created massive attention in Italy. And this was an action that actually was quite easy to do, uh, but uh, it was the occupation of the, gre the uh, roof of one of the five sheds at Green Hill. It lasted 30 hours, and these five persons have been on the top of that uh, shed for 30 hours. They cannot, could not be removed because they also had some tubes with they called arm locks. And so we had 200 people below with a demo. And that day, that action went on national TV for four days in a row and created such an attention that from that moment on, all over Italy, everybody knew what Green Hill was. And politicians were making like uh, running to, to be like on our side, you know, like making statements and trying to be on our side, even people, um, some politicians that created a lot of problems with us, they pretended to be the saviors of the uh, Green Hill dogs and they tried to come to our demos. This was the, big, the biggest demo just one month later, 5,000 people invaded the town. And just to show them one of the problems that we had with this campaign which is uh, when you get so big you get um, at a certain moment you're no more like a campaign group but there is like a popular movement all over the country that wants to stop this um, like many groups many campaigns all the organization they want just to uh, to be on board of it they want to do their in a in a positive way they want to give 
um, their help to the campaign. Sometimes some people just want to put their name in front, in, in the middle of this popular struggle that is going on. And this is the case of some politicians that really wanted to put their name and didn't want to help the campaign. Like, as a politician, you can stay in your room, write stuff, and help in the parliament. Of course, this is very welcome. But if you give statements and you say, you use this for your publicity, this is not really welcome from us. And these politicians, they try to come to our demos to get the cameras on them, while we always try to get the cameras on the animals and not even on ourselves. We try always not to um, put the attention of the media on us as activists, but always on the animals. And I'm very interested in explaining the strategy and the communication strategies we used, because I think some of this is um, quite also new and some of this is very interesting. Because when we did this action in, at the roof of Green Hill, it was not a typical and normal uh, roof occupation, because it, we tried to evolve it into a, um, also a media action. And these people on the roof, they had with them cameras, photo cameras, and also laptops. So they could communicate with the world from uh, above the roof, and they could film themselves, giving their, um, talking about their feelings, being above 500 dogs that were barking in, on this shed. And this shed is the one where the dogs are going to start in the following days being shipped to vivisection labs. So they, you know the images of these people speaking with dogs barking below them, they created such um, an emotional uh, contact between the people viewing this on TV, viewing this on the internet, and the dogs. And they always try to put the attention not on themselves, but on the animals. And this has always been one of the main uh, points for us, put the attention always on them. And from then on, we, did, we organized a lot of actions like demos, and we always, in, at the period, our enemy number one was no more the region, but the city council, because the region said we could uh, change something, we are waiting, but the city council really had uh, something that they could do immediately, which was, was remove the license of the, of the company. Because if you have a license uh, given to you by the city council or for a company, whatever it is, if you break some of the um, agreements you made, they can remove the license immediately. And Green Hill was breaking some of the agreements. We found out about it when we did, not really us, but some, um, uh, let's call them guards or um, animal welfare guards. They can. Uh, kind of authorities, they can go and check places. They went inside the farm and found a lot of things that were not okay. Among them, there was also a person of our campaign that was kind of infiltrated in this uh, raid inside Green Hill. And we could find out a lot of things that were later on used against them. And then the, the um, city council and especially the mayor of the town were public enemy number one. They were, she was on TV like once a week, interviewed and people storming in their offices and asking questions and people doing demos at their, in front of the council. And then some other activists started um, a hunger strike. Uh, this is not activists, it's just normal people or newcomers that just discovered about this campaign and animal rights activism a few months ago and decided to go on hunger strike for uh, um, a couple of weeks in front of the city council in full winter. And then, um, uh, there was, then there was a move. In that month, as I, as I told you, there was a lot of attention. Everybody in Italy wanted to close down the place. There were some um, politicians that they did what politicians should do, staying in the parliament and not coming to demos to get attention and publicity. And they, um, they worked on approving the, Italian Europe, the European directive in Italy with some changes that were like, one of them was banning the breeding of dog, cats, and primates for vivisection. And this was a very important act because then we can see in the future this was really working two years later almost. And so we started this campaign because it was approved at the Chamber of the Parliament, but then there was the Senate should vote 
And these two people here, you can see their faces. We put the faces on our website and social networks of all the people that were trying to stop this. The Senate was uh, deli delaying everything, delaying the works on this, uh, on this act, and they were trying to, to wait for the government to fall, which actually happened uh, last year, and so everything was stopped. And we were really fearing at the time that we will never succeed, actually. You know, when you do a campaign, there is always the times when you are, are positive and you say, okay, we're gonna win, we're sure we're gonna win, and then there are the po moments when you're a bit fearing, like, okay, it's going to be difficult. But at that moment, we were really positive because we knew um, the campaign was really, really strong. These people was, were having such a massive pressure against them that for the first time ever, the Italian Senate had to change some telephone numbers because of the telephone calls they were receiving every day. And they had to change some fax numbers, and these people were giving uh, press releases saying they were threatened, they were feeling scared because of all this massive amount of people uh, calling them and putting their names on the internet and trying to uh, call them to do what they should do. On the same time, we had also meetings with other people there in the Senate, in the Parliament, and we knew that there were a lot of VV sectors and pharmaceutical companies that were going there in their offices every day to, to lobby them. We do not know how, and, but we can imagine, of course, like not to vote anything against VV section. So it was a big fight, actually, going on. But, and there was this big public support on our side. So we decided to call Sorry, it was like this. Um, we call this operation or else we get angry, which is, uh, sounds very aggressive actually, but it's the name of an Italian comedy, a very funny movie. I, I think everybody should see it, very funny. And um, so we use this name, which sounds aggressive, but it's also funny, so it gave us also a lot of uh, good things happened under this name. One of these was a uh, easy action like uh, locking at the offices of Greenhill, saying, okay, close down or else we get angry. And also in this action, it was quite good the way we did a very simple action, but we um, managed to communicate well on it. It happened at half past seven, and at nine o'clock, there was already a video and uh, all the pictures around on the internet, and there was already media attention, and the journalist arrived there, and the, it was quite just growing up, actually. And then all over Italy, banners against the section were appearing on, on fences, on bridges, on monuments, from houses, really everywhere. And this was showing the popular support. We asked people put banners or uh, take pictures, and we uploaded really hundreds of pictures to show the popular support we had about Green Hill. We wanted everybody to know about this place. And then things were moving on. And we decided it was the right time, actually, for something that was really, really, now we get angry because you do not do what you should be doing there in the parliament and you're waiting too much. And there was this day, 28th of April, and I think that it's one of the most historic days, at least for us, for Italy and I, I think also for Europe, actually. And there was a demo which was actually um, it's quite difficult to explain all the situation. I have to not have uh, much time actually, but it was not organized by us. It was organized by a parallel campaign. Um, one of the problems of getting big, as I said before, you get a lot of people that is doing something to help you, but you get a lot of people that is doing some, something else to get the attention you created and move it, move it on themselves. So we even had someone organizing a parallel campaign, organizing national marches without uh, calling us, without asking us anything. We had a strategy, we had plans for actions, we had plans for stuff to do, and then you go on the internet the day before, after, and you see there is someone else organizing a march in the same town, in the same period. So this is really frustrating, this is really bad for activism, it's a really bad way to, a bad attitude. Uh, and it created us lots of problems, not only because it was ruining our strategies, when they were organizing stuff in the same period we had um, actions planned, actually, but also because these people were welcoming the same um, politicians we were not welcoming, for example, at our demos. We, they were welcoming them uh, taking 
uh, the um, publicity about uh, they were looking for you know like these attention seekers like politicians often are so they were changing the cards in the game and there was a lot of confusion people they had the name of the campaign really similar to ours and people were confused they didn't know anymore who was running the campaign against green hill which was actually a big problem for us for a few months so it was their demo it was not nothing special just 1000 people a lot less than the usual demos we organized before there. And we were there and we decided, okay, it's time. We were really angry and we decided, okay, it's really time to push people to do whatever happens. And this happened. And 70 dogs were liberated. It was an historic day. 13 arrests were made. And the, be the best thing about this day was the media support. There were people storming a place, people raiding a farm taking out beagles, 70 dogs, and this is a clearly illegal action. This is direct action, and all the media were supportive. And there were media interviewing people in the streets asking, did you hear about the Green Hill liberation? What do you think? And everybody was supportive of it. We have also been invited on national TV, on uh, family-friendly uh, programs, like for housewives or these kind of programs, talking about it, and they were all you know, showing the, the images of the liberation, they were all cheering and calling us heroes, which is something we are not, of course. We hate this word. And, but it's just to show that, uh, you know, we created a, such a support for our campaign, such a um, hate for vivisection and animal abusers, that also the, you know, direct action then became supported. And I think this is one of the um, social changes that were really are really something that we have to aim to. This is like a work people, organizations are doing, for example, with open rescues, that you say animals are not objects, it's, not, it's okay to liberate them from a cage, and we are taking all the risks it can take to have it, and we are publicly denouncing ourselves doing it, because this is a civil disobedience movement, and we are going to face charges, we are going to face the society that is considering these animals as objects, and we want all the social norms to change. So this day was a day of civil disobedience. All people without masks and all people of all ages um, were there storming the place and taking out animals. And I think this was like a, a popular action, like uh, with the people showing what they wanted actually. Then you, you can imagine the attention we had. In just five days, we could organize this day of action, global day of action, Many people here took part in it. We really are, are really thankful about it. In five continents, we could have 82 th cities joining the Day of Action and 38 cities organizing demos in Italy alone in five days of organizing it. So this means really crazy public and popular support for the campaign. And this was showing, you know, you see a picture in Milano, you can see the Dome of Milano. We had 600 people at that demo and about 500 in Rome, and really thousands of people in the streets everywhere. Everybody was asking uh, to, the, to the state, to whoever, you have to close down this place that is called Green Hill. You have to do something against vivisection. And then so, there was such a big support that even politicians, as we were talking about before uh, in other um, uh, interesting workshops before, you know, like there is some kinds of social norms when you see that everybody's against vivisection, you also st tend to be uh, like, you know, this is called social norms, you have to adapt to the social norms. But it happened so much that even the, uh, the head of the Italian Senate went there and was speaking out, criticizing vivisection and say, saying this is an atrocity, we have to stop. Of course, I do not trust him completely that it is in his heart, but it is a strong statement from, from him, actually, on the media. And then in June, just a few weeks later, we re released something that we had in our files for three or four years, and we waited the right moment to release it. It was a, a leak of documents and a phone call, an internal phone call inside Green Hill that was proving they were doing uh, illegal euthanasias of puppies because they were not uh, like they should be uh, in their appearance. Actually, they have no uh, health problems. They were just not um, as they should be in their appearance and they were killed. And they were killed not by the vet, they were killed by uh, normal workers, which is, of course, 
completely legal. We could prove it with this phone call, which also created a lot of hysteria. And then we could get 3,000 people again in, the, in a march at the farm. As, as you can see here from this picture, it's, it's impossible to show like people, it's difficult to handle these situations because it's not normal activists it's, um, or usual activists. It's people that really are there and they've never been in a demo before. They do not even think about, usually we have the banner and people on the back. These people were running in front of the banner, just saying we have to run before anyone else to go and, and storm the place and liberate the beagles again. And most of these demos were re really, really difficult to handle because we had thousands of people that were not even listening to us. There were a lot of crazy people actually at our demos. And they tried, the idea of the people was we assault the farm again, we liberate the beagles like it. They saw it happening one month before, they said, okay, this is the way demos are usually, but people that are doing demos for years, they know this doesn't happen so often actually. And this day the police had made it clear before, like this time there is no way we will charge you, so we were uh, uh, trying to behave actually. And just one month later then, when there was this peak of attention, we were organizing one, we were organizing a 10, day, ten days um, camping below Green Hill that what we wanted to be also a moment for people to meet and know each other, having uh, like workshops and meetings and demos all together. Then arrived a wonderful, a wonderful like news that was like the place was seized by the police and uh, one week later, 2,700 dogs were freed and they could get out of the place. This is Vegan. She's the first dog coming out of the farm. She has been given to this guy, Giuliano. He's an activist of our campaign. She's living, she's kind of our dog, collective dog now. And she was a pregnant mother with five puppies. And so this is, uh, was one of a really great day for us. And there was a lot of media attention and a lot of um, uh, emotion for us. And then one year later, now it's a bit more than one year, Green Hill has fired 15 workers. It's still empty. It's not closed yet. And they had once, they lost 1,700,000 euros and the dogs are finally legally staying for, with the families, 2,700 dogs. And uh, before speaking about it, I want to speak about just closing this um, thing I mentioned before, the law on vivisection. I think the most important effect of this campaign was at the side effects, which was opening the eyes of the public on vivisection, opening the, public of, um, the eyes of the public on animal abuse, and creating a more um, friendly a situation for us to do any kind of animal rights activism in the streets and uh, also when we, we go to lobby politicians on other issues actually this campaign with these uh, really acute puppies which of course uh, it's speciesism, speciesism because people love cute puppies that do not love rats and, and pigs and chickens that much we have, we have been using this to open the eyes of the public and we are sure that this also led them to think a lot about other animals, actually. And the law has been voted two months ago in Italy, again, with the new government. And the best thing is, it's not really actual law, they have to work a bit more, but the parliament decided that there is some rules that this law, new law in Italy has got to have. And it's not just, as I said before, banning the breeding of dog, cats and primates in Italy, which will be a good step, but it's actually just closing down Green Hill forever and not having any effect, but uh, experiments for drugs, alcohol, tobacco will be banned, experiments on uh, warfare experiments, on um, you know, military experiments are banned, and also um, uh, xenotransplantation experiments will be banned. And then there is other small restrictions that are quite minimal, but these bans are really, if they will be implemented there will be a huge effect for us because it means actually saving animals or reducing the number of animals being used in labs. So I've got just less than five minutes, I will be very, very quick. And after Green Hill, the, the way forward was like attacking the, uh, not only the breeders, but showing the people that there is 600 labs in Italy and they are all 
working whenever, wherever, and people do not know about it. This is an action we did in this April at the Milano University. We entered in the place, uh, five people blockaded themselves with locks in the, um, at their necks, um, blocking a whole floor, the fourth floor of the building, where um, there is thousands and thousands of animals. And this action was also planned, as I said before, with um, kind of communication skill that we developed in the years. Because we, these people inside, they had cameras, video cameras, and also computers, and we could have a streaming um, connection with them, which we didn't do, actually, because things went on quite fast. But we, are, we had organized a national march uh, that was going in the city center, at least uh, in the city center, and this is what the police thought, actually. But in, before the march, we occupied the place and moved all the people below the building, and so they stayed there for 10 hours supporting, hundreds of people supporting this action, and we got out, actually it's incredible, but we got out with 400 animals after 10 hours of occupation of the lab, and with uh, hundreds of pages of documents from this lab, and we are going to release a full uh, fact sheet on this, um, on this lab and what was going on uh, in this week, and this action really hit the VV sectors uh, where they really they fear most, and it created such a big debate, an international debate. Actions against uh, articles against us have been published in, in American newspapers like Nature and other blogs. Everybody from the uh, pro research lobbies they tried to attack us as terrorists. So the story is very long, it's very detailed. I cannot go into it. I'm happy to speak with you later if you want. I want to finish just before leaving some space for questions with um, what I really think is, I've always been dreaming to, to do something like this in my life actually, like um, taking out a dog or another animal uh, from a farm in the daylight with other people and all together really storming a place. So this day, dreams have become a reality on, in April. When, then two months later, we could have 2,700 of these dogs um, coming out of this farm. How did it happen? Actually, we have no really precise recipe. We tried our best. And, but what I can suggest you have is having, uh, developing an import, uh, theory, because theory is very important. It's where you start analyzing problems and then they lead you, the good theory leads you in the right path towards the right strategy. It's very, very important to think before you act. This is very, very important. Action, without action, there is no change, actually, whatever you can think if you just, uh, if there is no action, there is no change, and then you, have, you need the determination to bring on your actions until you reach the goals that you really want to reach. Thank you very much.